When you fast, be not as the hypocrites, sad, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is our Lord's call to us for the start of Lent. He wants us to not only fast, but he calls to us to fast and do so gladly. Now, this is something that, of course, for us is not natural to occur to us. We don't sacrifice willingly and and joyfully on a natural plane. In fact, our natural inclination when we approach Lent is to think, oh boy, another Lent, another time of sacrifice, another time of fasting, another time of being hungry and uncomfortable and doing extra. That's our natural inclination. It's okay that, that, that our body tells us to go that way. But it's for up to us to rise above that natural inclination, to not look at our Lent as a chore, as a burden upon us, but to rather, in the following of the gospel, to look at it and to embrace it in a supernatural way, a way that is far above that of simple human nature. Because the joyful gift awaits us in Lent, the joyful gift of fasting and of penance. So how do we accept that type of spirit for ourselves? How do we embrace our Lenten sacrifices and our Lenten fasts and our Lenten penances with that grace to perform them in a way that is joyful and that doesn't show up on our faces as we make our way through this Lenten season? Well, it's really few simple things to help us along the way. First and foremost, it seems a bit obvious, but it's worth mentioning because most of us probably forget to do just this. Each and every morning should be part of our prayers. should be part of our morning offering in, in addition to that, that not only are we offering up our works and our, and our thoughts and our, and our actions of the day, but that we are ourselves asking our Lord for the grace to persevere in our sacrifices and to do so with a truly generous spirit and to do so in a, in a way that is not, near, not merely just following what we have to do, but giving of the substance of ourselves, asking him to give us that strength to persevere when it's the most hard, when we get a couple of weeks into Lent and things start to drag on. That should be part of our prayer every single morning. And and we, because asking you shall receive, as our Lord tells us, we will receive those graces. We will be more ready to work with them upon their reception. And we will be ready to work with them because we've set our mindset each and every day where it needs to be. We've begun the day by focusing ourselves as well upon that. I know it's going to be hard at times, but I'm asking our Lord to help me. And I know that he will always do so because his grace is sufficient for me. And so therefore, I put it in my mind that I know at times I'll struggle, but I'm willing to work work the fight for the day. Each day, ask for that very grace, and you'll find yourselves more ready to follow through with that and persevere well in your offering. Now, secondarily, comes to us the means of being able to joyfully sacrifice and fast by focusing and meditating upon the whys, the why we fast in the Lenten season, and why we fast joyfully. First off, don't be sad about your fast and your sacrifices. You deserve them. You deserve them as a punishment, as a penance for your own sins. And we can find that right from the history of the Lenten Ash Wednesday ceremonies itself. Where did it originate? It came to us at the very beginning of the church. And in those early years, the church would call to to itself the public penitents, these people who had committed 
very grave sins and committed grave crimes against the faith or against the church or different different you know more serious sins and on ash wednesday they would come into the church and they would confess their sins publicly before everybody to hear them and then once they had confessed them the priests would then place ashes upon their heads and they would all lay prostrate upon the floor while reciting the seven penitential psalms there in the middle of the church. And then upon completing those psalms, they would rise up, they would process around the church, led by the clergy, and then they would be brought in the end, those public penitents, to the door of the church. And the celebrant of that, the bishop of that mass on Ash Wednesday, he would... uh, stand by as they processed out the door and he would and he would tell them we drive you out from the bosom of the church on account of your sins and on account of your crimes as adam the first man was driven from paradise because of his sin and then at that final words the penitents now being outside the doors would be closed the porters of the church would lock them, and then those public penitents would not be allowed admittance through the doors of the church again, all the way up until their absolution on Holy Thursday. Now that did not mean that they just went home and just relaxed, of course not. Rather, they came back each and every day, and they performed their penances outside the doors of the church. They knelt there for all to see, doing the harsh the harsh things that were prescribed to them for their crimes, while weeping for their sins and waiting expectantly and and with, with the full hope of that readmittance upon Holy Thursday when the absolution for their confession would finally be given to them and they'd be welcomed back into the body of the church. That's where the ashes ceremony originates from. The beginning of the church, it was given to only those who were public penitents. But as time went on, and soon the, that uh, after several centuries that the practice of the public penance fell away and was done away with by the church, well, at that point, everybody started to receive ashes. The clergy started to receive ashes. The people started to receive ashes. All was a marking that we all are sinful. And it is us who are deserving the punishment due to sin, our sacrifices that we must do, our penances that we must do. That's the origins of the ceremony. And we look, and while public penance, of course, is no longer required at all, and that everybody receives ashes, do we think ourselves any less sinful today than those who did have to perform those public penances in the beginning days of the church? Of course not. And so we fast because it's just. We fast because it's due to us. And we fast gladly because it's our means to pay off that debt that we justly owe to God. What a grace, what a blessing for us to be able to perform some sacrifice to work off what we owe. So that is what reason number one why we meditate on the gladness of our penance and our fasting. Secondly, so showing sorrow for fasting is based in pride. Our fast, in turn, has the intention of conquering pride. That is one of the chief intentions of fasting during Lent. Pride is the root of all sin when we really break it down. Pride is at its very core. Because in that instant, in that moment, when temptation comes to me and I think, I'm not going to fight. I'm going to give in. It's not through ignorance that I give in. I know that God has forbidden that action to me. But in that moment, out of pride, I know better. In that moment, out of pride, I want what I want. I want my own will in that instant. And for a split second, the pride takes over and I fall. So pride is that source of sin at its very core. 
Pride is the means by which sin even entered into the world to begin with. When Eve was there in the garden, how did, the, how did she fall? The serpent came to her. He tempted her and said that if you eat of that fruit, you will become as gods. And she ate of it because she wanted that. It was pride at its core. Well, we see the inverse of that in the example of Christ. And that first 40-day fasting, the first Lent, if you will, of the new law, when Christ himself was in the desert, and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And in the end of it, temptation came to him by the way of the same devil. And he uses the same means to try to make our Lord fall as he succeeded in doing in the garden so long before. He stands before our Lord and he tells him, why don't you take those rocks, those stones, and turn them into bread? You look hungry. And then... When our Lord rebukes him for that, he stands before him and brings him up to the pinnacle of the temple. And he says, It's said of the Lord that if he were to cast himself off, that angels would come and bear him up. Show me that work there. Two actions requested of him that would be a source of pride because he'd show off his power as God. He would show off what he can do to control nature, but it wasn't for for a true purpose. It was for a temptation against pride. And our Lord rebukes him the second time for that. Then thirdly, the devil brings him up to the top of a high mountain so he can see all of the earthly kingdom. And he promises him rule over that entire kingdom if he simply bows down and worships him. And our Lord rebukes him a third time because this was his third temptation against pride. There's a third temptation against his own pride to practice that vainglory and that seeking of power and of that seeking of riches of this world. And it was a conquering of the devil's pride himself and his own desire to be worshipped, rebuking him for his own wickedness in that folly of pride. That's our example. Christ is the model of humility. Christ conquers pride because it leads to sin. And to seek recognition from others on the very fact that we're fasting or that we're doing penance is based in its pride. Because what do we get? We get adulation or we get awe from people or people think that we're holier than we are. We get that pat on the back or that that little word of encouragement, that little bit that tells us, hey, you're doing just fine. We feel better. Because that is the reward that we're seeking in that moment. It's proud. It's it's vain. And our Lord tells us, if that's what we seek after, we have received our reward. But we don't seek after that. We instead seek... Only the spiritual reward from God, the secret God, who rewards those things done in secret. So we smile and we joyfully offer our sacrifices and our fasts. Thirdly, by Christ's example of his fast, we realize that fasting is a source of strength rather than weakness, as the world would have us to believe. When our Lord was fasting in the desert, why did the devil come and tempt him? Why did he think he could even succeed in such a way? It's because he doubted in those moments. The devil, he saw our Lord out there 40 days in the desert, fasting and doing hard penance there. And he looked at him and he remembered back to what he had seen up to this point. He had seen our Lord there in the Jordan being baptized with his own eyes. He had seen the Baptist calling him out and pointing him out and declaring him to be the Lamb of God. The devil had seen the Holy Ghost descend upon him in the form of a dove and rest upon his head. The devil had heard the words of God the Father coming out of the heavens, declaring him his only beloved Son of whom he is well pleased. He had witnessed all of that himself. But now, here was the man. He's in the desert. He's been fasting. He looks weakened now. How can God 
be weak. Oh, but that was the folly of the devil. Didn't realize that while the mortal shell, yes, at times, may suffer from hunger, it's the will, it's the soul that is strengthened by those acts of fasting. And that will, that, that divine will of God would not be shaken at all. And so Christ succeeds in rebuking him three times because he is strong. The same is for us. We fast, we sacrifice, and yes, at times I might not feel like I have the most energy that I could possibly have in the day. At times I will feel the pains of hunger in my stomach. At times I will feel the tiredness behind my eyes and the burn that is there from lack of sleep or long suffering in prayer and reading. But every moment that I sacrifice, that I fast, that I offer that up, I'm stronger in my soul. And that is what's going to have me succeed when temptation comes my way. Because I've mortified myself and I've gained that strength of my will. So why not be joyful in the fact that each day Lent goes on, I am stronger in the battle for my soul. I'm stronger before God. I am stronger in the face of temptation. What a joyful aspect to our fasting. Lastly, fasting makes us worthy to approach God. What greater joy could there be than that? We see this throughout the scriptures given to us. Moses, he fasts 40 days upon Mount Sinai. And he's there fasting and all the while waiting in expectation in his prayer and fasting. And after the 40 days is completed, what happens? The finger of God reaches down to him. God talks to him through the burning bush. And that finger of God writes upon those stone tablets the Ten Commandments to be given to the Israelites. Elias, he has to travel through the desert for 40 days fasting knowing that the Jews seek to kill him because they have fallen away from the true God. And he fasts 40 days through the desert, finally arriving at Mount Oreb, and he is allowed, after that 40th day, to speak to the Lord, to tell him why he's there. And our Lord rewards him by speaking back to him and telling him exactly what the plan is to save Elias, that he is going to, that he, that our Lord hears his prayer, that he recognizes his sacrifice, and that he delivers Elias from certain death while slay, slaying all of those Jews who have worshipped Baal and the false gods and given up on the true God, leaving only behind those who are faithful. Our fast, likewise, doesn't merely strengthen us against temptation, but it actually brings us closer to God. It helps us grow in holiness. It helps us get closer to that ultimate goal of saving our souls. It is not merely simply fighting temptation, but we grow in perfection because of our sacrifice. And, as the Gospel talks about, that is the secret reward that we seek after. Our fastings, our sacrifices, they must be given and given generously, given joyfully by us. It is by those sacrifices and those fasts that Lent truly can be the greatest season of spiritual growth for us. All of the things that we suffer in Lent, our discomfort, our suffering, our hunger, those things are merely temporary for us. And it is a, but a small price to pay for such incredible opportunities to help us to save our souls. And the realization of great rewards given to us for such a small gift in return should fill us with the greatest of joy in this, the beginning of our time of fast and sacrifice. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.